Well, hey, if you have experienced the Mandela effect and you've researched it and you have come to the conclusion that it is a genuine phenomenon, and then you have dared to share that belief with people that did not share your belief, then you've probably been called delusional. Now, you may also have been told that you were going astray or that you need medication or that you should just focus on the gospel. Certainly, you've been told you should consider that you're taking these things out of context. These are just confusions between different translations or their modernizations or you're just misremembering. Cognitive confusion. You're befuddled. You're you're just kind of turned around like you've been playing a pinata game where they spin you around and the blindfold on. You're just you're just mixed up. Well, the problem that we have, Mr. and Mrs. Unconvinced, with these arguments is that they are unconvincing. Just because you say I'm delusional doesn't mean that I'm delusional. You have to prove your point. The burden of proof is on you because we are claiming an experience and there are many, many, many of us and we are relying not only on our memories. We have seven forms of proof. So what I'd like to do is just drill down on this idea that we're delusional and see what it means and see what the scriptures say See if there's any validity to the idea that we're delusional because we're claiming that our reality is malleable and things that we vividly remember no longer exist as we remember them. So if we are delusional, how is it that we're delusional? This is the question that I would like the unconvinced to try to answer with some specificity because the definition of delusional means that you believe what is untrue and you're resistant to facts. But is that true? Okay, so for convenience, I'll call those that are testifying that this phenomenon is real as someone that's Mandela affected. And all that means is you experienced the Mandela effect and then you came to the conclusion that it's a supernatural phenomenon. That would make you Mandela affected. Whereas the unconvinced also experience the Mandela effect, but they refuse to conclude what's obvious, that there's a phenomenon taking place, and instead they, they impose a, a naturalistic reason for the experience. Because go to 100 pastors, ask them who laid down with the lamb, they'll all say lion. I can stump 100 pastors in a row with 10 out of 10 scriptures. That's not possible. It's not logistically or statistically possible. Do you understand? That's a catastrophic memory failure that could not happen unless they had been stricken with Alzheimer's. And that's not the case because I could do it with 100 of them. So it's not mental illness. Like if you went to your aging parent and they couldn't recognize you, the conclusion you would draw is that they have been smitten with mental illness. Well, 10 simple Bible quiz questions that pastors get wrong is not misremembering. That is a catastrophic memory failure. So we are experiencing or observing these types of proofs, these types of facts. And then we're going to the unconvinced saying, look, this is what we're experiencing. And it's the unconvinced that is resistant to facts, not us. So if you are resistant to facts, it's not us that's delusional, it's you. And I think, um, what the unconvinced actually mean when they call us delusional is that we're actually psychotic, which means you're seeing things that are not there. But that's not what's happening because one of the proofs is similar to me. In other words, everybody will tell you the Monopoly guy had a monocle. Everybody will tell you mirror, mirror on the wall. Everybody will tell you the lion laid down with the lamb, etc., etc. So 
it's not psychotic. Okay, so when you call me delusional, if you're insinuating that I'm seeing things that are not there, that is not factual. What's happening is happening to all of humanity, and it's happening all over the flat earth, everywhere. And the, the, the delusion would have to come and be applied to the conclusion that you draw from the experience, not from the experience itself, because that's universal. So once again, let's look at the different passages that are typically hurled at us. 2 Thessalonians 2, uh, verse 11, For this reason God will send them a powerful delusion so that they believe the lie. Okay, we're going to come back to that. The second one is 1 Timothy 4, but the Spirit explains, Explicitly says that in the latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, of course, if you don't believe that this is happening, you would certainly put someone claiming the Bible is being fiddled with by the devil in the category of a doctrine of demons and falling away from the faith. I, I could understand that very easily. However, the facts don't support your position that the Bible isn't changing. The facts support the position that the Bible is changing because we first have hundreds of thousands of examples in pop culture and in the realm outside the Bible. Movie lines, people's names, spelling of words, history, anatomy, geography, all multiple categories with hundreds and hundreds of examples in each category with residual evidence supporting our vivid memories. These are incontrovertible. These are irrefutable evidences to support our testimony. They're not non-existent evidence. They are existing and they are compelling because they're what's called cooperative. They're cooperating our testimony. And there's layers of them. And they can't be just brushed aside as the uh, uh, number of, the, of mistakes that take place in the normal course of business. That's preposterous. It's statistically impossible if you go to newspapers.com and you put in any number of products. Um, depends is a, is a very strong memory for people. This product w was called Depends and everybody remembers it being called Depends because it had a commercial. You can depend on Depends and it's a vivid memory. And so you go into newspapers.com and you can find 800 display ads that say Depends with an S, but it's never been that. All the way back to its or original launch, it was always Depend. So if, if it was always depend, you, unconvinced, trying to convince us that it's, it's, it's in the normal course of business that 800 different display ads would be posted in newspapers incorrectly is absolutely statistically impossible. It's not, it's not improbable. It's impossible. It's, it's statistically impossible because you have that one times hundreds of them. We don't believe you, okay? We don't accept that concept whatsoever. It's preposterous. So your arguments are unconvincing. And so Romans 8, 28 says, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to depraved minds. Well, this is scary stuff. Being accused of being turned over to a depraved mind by God because we're claiming this is happening. And, you know, essentially, it really rests on this one here, 2 Thessalonians 2.9, for this reason God will send them a powerful delusion. Why? Because they didn't love the truth. And so what happens? They believe the lie. Well, what would that lie be? 
All right, so from the perspective of the unconvinced, it would be that we believe that the Bible is able to be changed. That would have to be the lie that we're believing that then brings a curse of delusion upon us. That's really the main thing that would stand in the way of accepting the obvious evidence that something has changed our Bibles. The testimonial evidence, the vivid sexual innuendo, and the biblical paradoxes all taken together now provide overwhelming evidence that the Bibles that we now have are not what we have had over the last decades. That's my testimony and the testimony of hundreds of people that I've talked to directly and thousands that I've interacted with over the last six years. This is the established position of the Mandela affected and the suggestion from the unconvinced that we are simply misremembering is not only unconvincing, it's offensive. It certainly hasn't persuaded us. And as I said, it's not because we are resistant to facts. We have facts and we're going to look at one of the, those forms of evidence right now. Okay, so as we have journeyed through this quagmire of bizarro land, we have found that there were prophecies that seemed to clearly indicate that this was foretold. We've also found residual evidence, which is very, very uh, strong evidence corroborating, you know, because if we were just all having, you know, some mass hyp hypnotic thing or some demonic delusion that we're all seeing things that wouldn't explain why there are all of these toys or sneakers that say luke i'm your father or toys that say luke i'm your father or hallmark greeting cards that say mirror mirror on the wall on them these things exist in the natural realm it's not just photoshop tricks on internet they exist in 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 the natural and they're like remnants or breadcrumbs or some phenomenon where the change or whatever it is we experienced wasn't complete. And these evidences corroborate our vivid memories that we're claiming we have because they're the same as our memories. But what I'm going to look at is the next one, which is flip-flops. Flip-flops. Okay, so Okay, so during the last 5 or 6 years or so, many of us have struggled with this topic as a community because as we got into it, a couple years into it, we all experienced the first time a flip-flop, which I think it was Flintstones. We woke up one morning and Flintstones lost its T. And all of the graphics, both on the internet and in real world, said Flintstones. There was no T. Then it, later on, it flipped back again. Then everything had its T again. Then there was Houston, we have a problem. That one changed. And then it changed back. Tidy Cats, of course. I remember watching videos that people made where it was Tidy Cats. And now they went into pet stores filmed the products on the shelf and it said tidy cat there was no s well then it's changed back again to tidy cats and then we saw chuck e cheese flip to chuck e cheeses and as a, as you can expect it flipped back again so the things that we're looking at are almost like they happened right before our eyes. And I could get affidavits signed from hundreds of people that will testify that they observed this happening. And here's an example, uh, because I made a video regarding the Chuck E. Cheese change with the first time it happened. And during this change, you could actually go in and find both logos. And we confirm when we do this that 
this is not just a company changing its name because we go back to the original trademark and you find that it always was Chuck E. Cheese's in that timeline. Now, I don't have that graphic, but what I did get is uh, what you're looking at here is the Wikipedia from March 12th. Is this the right one? Let me see. Oh, this is the older one. Okay, so this is the new one. And as you can see here, the timeline doesn't jive with reality because the name was shortened to Chuck E. Cheese's in 1994. This is according to the present timeline. And then the name was shortened again to Chuck E. Cheese in 2019. But I did a video in February of 2020, and as you can see, it said Chuck E. Cheese's. Okay, but according to the present timeline, it had already changed to Chuck E. Cheese and prior to that. Now, you could try to claim that Wikipedia just didn't update their records, but this is just one of many examples of residual. It just happens to be one that I personally have in my own possession. See, here is the image on my computer with the computer stamp. That's why I'm using this one. February 18th, 2020 is impossible in this timeline. This, if what I'm saying is true, what you're looking at is a time distortion anomaly or some sort of experiential anomaly that we don't understand what's happening, but it, this is evidence to us. It's very compelling. Okay, so here's my question to the unconvinced. And I'd like to just ask you to put aside all of your preconceptions about whether the Bible can change or not, whether or not, you know, something like the Mandela effect is even possible, you know, because those will cause you to be resistant to facts. But what I'd like to ask you is how exactly are we delusional when it comes to this flip flop? Logistically, specifically, get granular with me, explain how we are deluded. Because you're saying we're deluded, but how are we deluded? In other words, how is it possible that hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people, because remember, you, you've got full, full page spreads on this topic in housekeeping, good housekeeping, popular mechanics, uh, Reader's Digest, and there's two or three other mainstream magazines that have done huge spreads. There's several movies now. There's uh, mainstream news is covering it. And now you're about to have a Netflix documentary on that's pro Mandela. OK, so this is not just a few people in the dark corners of the Internet and then the Internet's amplifying their voices. That's total nonsense. So when I say there's hundreds of thousands of people, I'm not exaggerating. OK, so how is it possible that all these people will testify that they watched Chuck E. Cheese change before their eyes to Chuck E. Cheese's and then change back? Now, you have also observed the same phenomenon. You see the same things we do. So you can't you can't tell me that I'm seeing things because it is happening. Because if I had been with you during that time, you would have seen it also. So if I'm delusional, how am I delusional? How did I experience what I experienced? Because it's corroborated by my residual evidence and the testimonies of hundreds of thousands of people. We experienced it. How did we experience it? Okay. And if you can't answer that, then I just respectfully ask you to stop calling us delusional. If you don't want to open your mind to this possibility, that's up to you. But in terms of going astray, uh, if you're suggesting the Bible has changed supernaturally, then yes, you would be called, you would be categorized as a heretic in today's Christian circles. Uh, we have certainly moved away from orthodoxy, which all that means is your orthodoxy is 
authorized or generally accepted theory, doctrine, or practice. I think it's safe to say that the majority of the body of Christ does not embrace the doctrine that the Bible can change, <laughs> right? So you are definitely out of orthodoxy if you're Mandela affected. No question about it. And that's just the cross you have to bear. And keep in mind, you're in good company. The Inquisition happened over a 600 year period. And pretty much most of the people that the Catholic Church burned at the stake had their Bibles hung around their necks, were people like you and I, people that believed God and believed the Bible and refused to recant to embrace some dogma of the Catholic Church. So the Mandela affected refused to embrace the dogma that the Bible can't change because it's really what it is. There aren't any passages that clearly teach that Scripture can't change. It teaches that the Word of God can't change. And we, or at least I, I can't speak for everybody, have been forced to come to the conclusion that that's not the same thing. Scripture and the Word of God are not the same thing by necessity because my Bible teaches me that two men are in a bed and two women are grinding and that men are breastfeeding and that you can sacrifice female sheep in the book of Leviticus or you can sacrifice turtles in the 12th chapter of Leviticus in the King James Version. I believe it's verse 8. And the Bible is filled with grammatical errors, punctuation errors, biblical paradoxes, sexual innuendo that's so graphic that it defies description how church leaders cannot be shocked and calling us up and asking how could this be. The phenomenon of the blindness of church leaders and Christians to me is more baffling than this phenomenon itself many times. And of course, the idea is always put forward that we're leading others astray. But you have to take that from somebody that doesn't believe it's happening, right? If you don't believe that the Bible's supernaturally changing, then of course you would look at us as someone that's leading someone astray. But as I've said, your arguments that it's not happening are unconvincing. You're delusional. You're not looking at the facts with any type of uh, intellectual honesty. We are willing to explore the idea of flip-flops. How is it possible? And unless you can answer that and the other questions, then your arguments are unconvincing. And so to suggest that we're leading people astray is not true because it is happening. And because it is happening, we are compelled to speak about it. So on that note, I'm going to go ahead and transfer this to a, an interview that I did with my good friend Mike from Awakened Saint on YouTube. Be sure to uh, like and describe, uh, subscribe to Mike's channel. He's got some great content. And I think this interview will help to try to answer some of these other questions. And so thanks for listening. And here we go. All right, so there's all that. And let me just turn you loose and see where we go with this. Did I just screw up showing a Christian fallen angel stuff? What did I do? Well, <laughs> I think you might want to explain what we're, what we're trying to address, which is this concept that I just want to focus on the gospel, meaning you should only focus on the gospel. It's right. a rebuke when somebody says that to us if we are um, if we are pursuing these topics with any type of passion or interest, then we're looked upon as going astray. And I think it's I think it's a very uh, it's an unbiblical point of view, and it's definitely perilous because, we're in a period of time when revelation is, seems to be unfolding and you want to just 
pretend it's not unfolding? I mean, tell that to all the people that took the, uh, you know, that thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that's all I'm going to say. Hello? <laughs> I almost had to bring Greta out on you. Because, <laughs> you know, you know, I went, I remember going into churches that they were all masked up, they're distancing, and a bunch of them, you know, went right in line, went down to the pharmacy and whatever. So doesn't that matter then that we're conspiracy theorists at that point? Because those of us who are awake didn't line up for that. So there's a practical right. example of why this matters, why these well, topics matter. The thing is, we have a Bible, right? And we know it's manipulated, but we know there's a lot of good in the Bible. And I think you and I said this yesterday on the phone. If, if God the Father did not want us to know the ending, why is it already in the book? What is going to happen has been given to us from day one. We just right. have to read it, right? Absolutely. Yeah. The, the idea of I only want to preach the gospel or I only want to focus on the gospel is and it's a it's a concept that is unbiblical because if that was true, your Bible would only be, you know, I don't know how many pages, but it wouldn't be this thick. Right. Here's a Bible. Look at how thick it is. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot there that has nothing to do with the salvation of souls or the teachings of Christ or the gospel. Um, I mean, the Bible addresses or teaches us all the spheres of life, finances, prophecy, underworld, demons, healing, wisdom, business, government. You know, when the righteous rule, the people rejoice. Uh, how to approach God, church government, uh, all of these things matter. And the bottom line is, okay, if you're a tent evangelist, yeah, your message is salvation. That's your job description. You just preach the gospel. But what if you're a, a, a marriage counselor? Um, are we to believe that that person is preaching another gospel because they're not focusing on the gospel or... What about a person that feels called to politics? They go in, you know, to do good in that sphere. Well, when they're in that mode, they're not preaching the gospel. So are we to understand that they're preaching another gospel? Or no. that they're, they've gone astray, right? Because their emphasis is not, you know, they're not quoting scripture all day in, the, in their job. That's basically, I mean, what does it mean? What does it actually mean when you say, I just want to focus on the gospel? Or, Mike, you should. You shouldn't be dabbling in all these dark themes and Mandela effect. And, you know, you're, you're leading people astray. Well, show me chapter and verse. Well, actually, I, I have some examples of the scriptures that I think those that are trying to put that forward are, are relying on but it turns out if you actually look at them in context which is what we're always accused of not doing right we're accused of taking things out of context sure. those passages actually support our position which i can share with you as we go forward well, you might you might if i throw something out just real quick yeah. Before no you read yeah those. no yeah no go for it yeah and, and this is not new to john because we had this conversation on the phone but we time is short let's just throw that out there okay so from my position time is short if i'm looking at a clock of time based off of the transition we're getting ready to go through where and we know what's coming if you've read the book you know what's coming so time is short right now time being short can i sit on information wondering how baby you are no absolutely not so if if say for instance let's give you an example I'm, I'm John's neighbor, and I notice a van with blackened windows keeps stopping by his house. Every <laughs> it always stops by his house, and it's odd because it hasn't happened before. And they seem to be taking note of when he's home and when he isn't. And I'm his neighbor across the way, and I'm like, well, I don't know John a whole, I don't know him really well. Maybe I should wait and get right. to know John before I go across the street and warn him about this van, right? So... 
some time passes, four days or so, and then uh, there's a bunch of blue lights all over, and there's an there's an ambulance, and guess what? John right, right. killed because these guys killed him and took some gold bullion he had in his house. They knew about it, and that's why they were there. And Mike sat on the information because our relationship was baby. I didn't know John well enough to warn him of a danger. Guys, wake up. All right, go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Or, or it's secular, right? So, you know, I find out a tornado's coming and you're distracted. I'm, I'm not going to go warn you, though, because, you know, if I'm only ministering the gospel or preaching Jesus, then that would be outside my purview to warn you of the danger you're in because I only handle the oracles of God, right? It's so right. superficial, you know, it's not either or. Now, the bottom line is you have different people are called to different things. So if that's your passion to just totally preach agree. Christ, go for it. But don't Absolutely. sit back and criticize us if God has called us to a different sphere. See, what happened with me is when I found out the Federal Reserve wasn't federal, I fell into this hole, right? And that's because what happens is then you say, well, if that's not true, what else isn't true? And you start going <laughs> down into, you begin to question officialdom. It's a very rocky road for most of us. And it ended up with me being divorced. And I've talked to hundreds of people who have been divorced in the last six years. Hundreds. That's Personal horrible. correspondence back and forth with hundreds of people. Without exaggeration. Okay, so I got a burden for the body of Christ who are truthers. Christian truthers have a very difficult cross to bear. And I got a burden for those people, and I started doing a talk every Sunday night for a year, ministering to the specific needs of that cross-section of this little corner of God's kingdom. Now, if you're going to hold me in derision and tell me I'm preaching a false gospel because of that, have at it. Because yeah, of, there's not a lot of time, so it's not it's not a good position to be in, in my opinion, someone doing that to a called person. Because we all have a calling. We have some of us are just called to praise and worship, and that's great. Some of us are called to warn. In fact, if you kind of notice more and more as we get closer, are called to warn. Imagine that. Mm. That's my two cents. No question. No question. And what is a false gospel, really? If you look at that passage where Paul is talking about it, it's all about the gospel means the whole story, okay, original sin, you know, cats give birth to cats, dogs give birth to dogs, sinners give birth to sinners, right? So we're all born into in sin in a fallen state, and, and there's nothing you can do to fix that. You'll never be good enough, but don't worry. God sent his son, and the whole story rolls out. And then you have to accept this gift, but it's free, Praise the Lord. That's good news. That is the gospel, okay? If right. you're preaching salvation through works, that's another gospel. But if you're if you found out the Bible's supernaturally changing and it's turned your world upside down and you've lost your marriage and your friends and your church and you can't go back to church, now you're completely isolated. In fact, let me read w one thing uh which which describes the journey that we're on that I feel called to minister to. This is Leviticus 13, 45. And it's it's a, a, a instruction on how to deal with lepers. Okay. It says a diseased person must wear torn clothes and let his hair hang loose, and he must cover his mouth and cry out, unclean, unclean, as long as he has the infection. He remains unclean. He must live alone in a place outside the camp. Okay, so when I read that, it struck me as being very similar to my journey and many journey, many people's journeys. So instead of the infection, just put the term conspiracy theorist in there. And so I came up with my own version. This is the CTV version, the conspiracy theorist version. 
Okay, Leviticus 13, 45 in the CTV version. You ready? Go ahead. A delusional fringe kook must wear a tinfoil hat and be continuously singled out for embarrassment at family gatherings. And he must be told in a thousand different ways to keep his ridiculous ideas to himself so that he will live in isolation. As long as he believes these harebrained schemes and continues to be duped by Photoshop tricks, he will be viewed as a knucklehead. Even if he remains silent for 12 consecutive months, he must live alone in a place outside the camp. <laughs> right? All right, that so that's crazy. That's our reality, and it's crushing people, okay? I'm 60, and I live in an apartment by myself. I have four children. This is a nightmare, and there's tons of people like me. So forgive me if, if I'm not, you know, preaching the gospel. However, if you go back and listen to almost 100% of my videos on the Sunday night live stream, Always, there was a call to salvation, a, a, per, a fairly extensive explanation of the plan of salvation, and then a clear call, invitation to surrender your life to this God and his son and the whole package, right? So, right. yes, yes, we always have to keep the main thing the main thing. And we always have to keep Jesus in the center of our message. But that doesn't Absolutely. mean... You're a one trick pony, you know, old, you understand. Well, here's, here's the thing, uh, throw this out there, uh, where to win people to Christ, right? So if you, like, for example, someone I worked with on YouTube a, a while back, we had a guest on and she just started preaching the disciples to this guy and he was a non-believer, but he was willing to listen. And yep. here's the thing. If you got a non-believer, you have to find your way in to get that person to understand what you're trying to show them. You can't throw math at someone who's never seen math. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, Like absolutely. you can't just say, well, the disciples say it's so, so it's so. And then you focus, if you're not, if you're not steering your message to the receiver, they're not going to hear it. And it may not be because they don't want to hear it. It may be because they just don't get the concept. So we have to, yep. we have to, in a loving way, give the truth out. And Jesus is the truth. So as the truth becomes prominent in that person's mind, they will begin to listen. But you can't just throw gospel at them because it can be received as hateful because they don't understand what you're even saying to them. They understand what I'm That's I'm a great point. Them. Yeah, because you have – that's a great point. Because you have normies or the unconvinced, and you also have Christian normies, right? You have believers who are genuinely saved, but they don't think the moon landing is fake, or you know, right. they don't they don't know about flat Earth or Mandela or any of these things, and they don't want to know, and they don't want you to know, and so there's this conflict. Um, and so, tell me again what you were saying because I just forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Help me out. I was saying that you can't. You, it, it's not helpful. I don't say can't, and that's that's definitive. I don't like that. But it's not helpful to say like John say like you're just a non-believer. You, you've never read the Bible. You don't know the the stories of the disciples. Oh, right, right, you right, don't right. know. And then I come at you and I say, well, Paul declared, and then I just say these things. And you're like, well, who's Paul? So you don't know that Paul was Saul. You don't know the the transition from Saul right. to Paul. Like you have none of that history in your mind, and I have all that history. I have to understand the guy I'm talking to or woman I'm talking to doesn't have that. You, that's what I was saying. Right. That's that was so prompted what I was trying to say. Thank you. So my my community is very diverse. I mean, there's people from all different worldviews that are logging in because they believe the Bible's supernaturally changing and the Mandela effect is real. Because that's my primary focus is providing a biblical ex uh, analysis of the Mandela effect. However, right. I talk in general terms. In fact, I finally am about to release a book called The Conspiracy Theorist Survival Guide, Truth or Advice for Truthers. So it's more general in that sense, but it's going to be a book that describes our journey and how to respond to it, how to survive this journey, you know, but it's for a more broader 
audience. So I've tried to continue to be blatantly Christ-centered and give the gospel while still providing a venue for people that maybe don't have a biblical worldview because they it's kind of like going to an AA meeting. You you know, you might be a blue collar guy sitting right next to a white collar guy. Alcoholism doesn't care, right? You're every there's no demographic. Right? right? And in fact, that's true for Christian truthers or, or Christian normies too. Tr Christian normies seem to feel like truth is optional. That's yeah. That, like, that irks me so much. Uh, like truth it. is truth. It doesn't matter if it's not in your little bailiwick of biblical, you know, doctrine, you know. I'm like, sorry, you know, it's still true that the, the entire power structure has fabricated a, a fake reality in almost every sphere. Yeah. Every sphere is fake. Absolutely. And people that leave the matrix look crazy to those that are still in the matrix. Yeah, I'm noticing that. In the land of crazy people, the sane people look crazy. That's for sure. <laughs> well, see, the thing is, and from my observation point, I've noticed right around 2016, 2017, uh, what do you call it? They, they've used this... Well, they, they call it the apocalypse, right? And, and when you look at the when you look at Hollywood, they say the apocalypse is coming. Oh, that's the end of everything. Well, the word apocalypse means great awakening. And I believe the great awakening has begun because how in the heck are we seeing these things? How in the heck did I grow up to the point where yeah. I was like all the way up to the age I'm at now? And all of a sudden I'm like, wait, you mean the governments are all working together? What what? I mean, what? <laughs> Why do they all have uh, penile-looking statues in front of them? That's that's odd. And then a normie will say, "Well, it's Egyptian." Okay, well then, why? Why? Why don't you get to the why? Why are these Egyptian stuff? Why does everyone emulate the Egyptians? Why? There's so many questions unanswered. Well, that's the, that's what I found in researching this book is that I realized what it means to be a truther. At the center of that is a is a mechanism, or a, you know what happened to us. Well, what it was was you started to question officialdom. That's essentially the quintessential hallmark of a truther. For me, it was when I found out the Federal Reserve wasn't federal, and I said what a lot of people said to myself. I said, if that's not true, what else isn't true? And so that. That internal shift of a belief system, it's a core belief that you abandon this programming never to question officialdom, to trust them, basically, and begin to be cynical, not cynical, but suspicious and and like the Bereans, right? The Bereans yeah. received what Paul said, but they went back and checked on him. That's how we should be. That's right. And so what happens is once you begin to question, man, every you every rock you turn over to controversy. <laughs> like, how did I how is it that I went my whole life and never knew the boats don't actually go over the curve? Well, how did I so many times? I mean, we're not gonna venture into your topic because I'll go live on your channel whenever you actually <laughs> do this. But I was like, I thought about this the other day. How how many times have I flown at five or ten thousand feet and not noticed there's no curve? Nothing's curving. I, right. And I'm looking right at it. I'm literally looking right at it. You know. Then now I see it. It's weird. Well, it's it's a lot of things, but it's the reticular activation center. I did some research on that. It's fascinating. You know, the the example I love is the. Uh, the single mom or the mom sleeping in a noisy New York apartment with the baby across the room and there's sirens and horns outside and she sleeps right through it. But as soon as the baby makes a sound, she wakes up because there's this part of your brain called the reticular activation center or something like that. And it filters out everything that's inconsistent with your paradigm. So you decide you're going to buy a Honda Accord and now all of a sudden, everywhere you look, you see Honda Accords, whereas you never noticed them before. Okay, so if your paradigm is that NASA, you're a NASA fanboy, 
and I show you, you know, the lunar lander, it looks like it's made of cardboard and curtain rods and there's no blast crater underneath. And, uh, you know, it just goes, woo, <laughs> it just goes right by you. Well, there's so much deeper with that stuff because I just I just shared a video before we went live that I you probably didn't see because it literally just happened. But Apollo and Artemis are twins. And NASA has focused on the Apollo missions, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then the latest visitor to the moon is Artemis. Isn't and then you have the memorials in 9-11 are both holes to bottomless pits representing Apollo and Artemis. And then facing it is a phoenix, which is the dead god rising again. That's weird. Maybe I shouldn't talk about that. No, just... okay. But see, that's our theme, right? The th those things are true, <laughs> right? And by the way, yeah. Mike and I Mike and I talk like every day almost, and we have these conversations, and yeah. we're like, man, this <laughs> is great stuff. We should just do this live. So this is that's what we're, we're doing. doing. So, so the point is that what I've noticed is that there are certain people who are really tuned in to the prophetic, and they are very often – looked upon as being eccentric or kooky or over spiritual or whatever but they tend to uh they tend to be able to discern the spiritual significance of natural events and the more you see the more you see have you ever experienced that yes it's like a tidal wave once you right. see it so so basically the way god works is he works on desire the more you want to know him so the more you'll know him, you will Perfect. know God in direct proportion to how much you want to know him. Perfect. Right? That's exactly how it works. Absolutely. Okay. So if you are attuned to the events like uh, the sons of Issachar, it says that they were, uh, uh, where's the sons of Issachar? Uh, 1 Chronicles 12, 32, the sons of Issachar who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. Sounds like they were pretty cute, clued into the geopolitical events or they had wisdom about the world systems and they were useful to God for that reason. Um, if you are that person, then you are going to tend to see spiritual significance in current affairs and as a result you will be uh someone that god can use to warn others to prepare so the bible teaches that the wise man sees danger afar off and prepares and so not everybody's going to be a watchman on the wall not everybody's going to be a warning person or have a prophetic edge okay because you can have a prophetic edge and not be a prophet i don't know who a prophet is i don't i don't know how you i'm come, not a prophet i'm not i don't know how you become to the place where you, you would i would never call myself a prophet in fact anybody that i've ever met who i thought was a prophet never called himself a prophet yeah I and mean, that makes sense too doesn't it they always said i'm not a prophet well yes you are you totally like read people's mail all the time i've seen i've had it done to me where people told me the secrets of my heart and things that they couldn't have possibly known so what is that that's useful it's awesome sure. it's one of the benefits of being with god is prophecy the future knowing the future having uh you know like I think it was Amos where it says God does nothing un unless he tells his prophets first. That's kind of right. handy. That's kind of useful. On the couch. The prophets yeah. Are I on think the couch I, and Amos now. But see the, the people that are putting this narrative forward that we should only be focusing on the gospel. Like, you know, if we're, if we're focusing on the fact that the Bible's changing supernaturally, hello, that's really important. You can't just continue to have Bible studies as usual anymore. It's a new. Uh, no, you really just can't. That that is. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Yeah, please. Am I off track. No, please go. We're just going where we're going. Off track. But that's that's part of my frustration that you know, 
I listened to a live stream yesterday and I was getting frustrated because it's great to be a minister. Yes. Praise God. You're, you're a minister. If that's what you're called to do, praise God. But what's this say behind me? What's that say? Why does that say that and behind lamb. me? Lion and lamb. Why? Now, how can you be a minister and deny the lion of Judah? Because that's the thing I see immediately. If you do not mention what's going on in any way whatsoever, I see it as you're denying the lion of Judah. And if you guys know the story, the lion doesn't come all friendly healing people. You know, I mean, they do parodies now on TV. It's like Jesus returned. And and then this parody I watched is like, well, how's he doing? And he was like, he's pissed off. You know, he, he doesn't come back as a lamb. He's right. already done that. See this behind me? That doesn't yeah. say wolf. Yeah. No wolf. You have to admit what is going on because time is short. Time is short. That's my point. Yeah, this is a tough one. I mean, if you suggest the, I guess we're on the Bible changes for here for a minute, because it's kind yeah. of a, what we're being attacked for is that we're covering this topic. And, and the people that have all kinds of high sounding arguments don't believe it's happening. So of course, they're very strident and upset with us, because basically, it's tantamount to calling God a liar. But it's not. God's righteousness and his, you know, infinite perfections are not impugned in any way because the Bible's becoming inaccessible through this prophecy that's being fulfilled. Because if that's true, then God would already be held in derision for all the people that live in the jungles of Borneo that have never had the Bible and they're dying without Christ. They, you know, they never got a chance to hear the gospel. Well, that's inaccessibility. But there's other all kinds of doctrinal reasons why the Bible can be supernaturally changing without God's, you know, word being impugned. He's not lying, because he said, "Thy word is forever settled in heaven." It still is. <laughs> it doesn't mean the Scripture won't change. So we make the distinction between the Word of God and Scripture. You also have the principle that Scripture changes Scripture. You have. Uh, dispensational doctrine, which can explain why there's promises that seem to indicate scripture won't change or the Bible won't change, but it's actually temporary, like Daniel chapter 12, I believe. So I, I'm not going to get into it now, but there's, there's plenty of orthodox doctrine to explain the, the supernatural Bible changes, especially that it was prophesied that it would happen. So we have biblical okay. authority to make this claim that it's happening. So assuming it's happening, though, the, the, the critics are upset that we're actually talking about it. In other words, they believe that it's unproductive to try to wrestle with this. We should just keep it quiet because you're going to, you know, destroy people's faith. Doesn't make but, any sense. I can say personally, my faith has grown a hundred times over since I've saw this, you know, so I don't opening your mind to truth gets you closer to God because Jesus is the truth. It doesn't bring you away from him. That doesn't make sense. Right. It would, and it's, first of all, if you believe that this is truly happening, then the, then it is a conspiracy because it's a, it's hidden from 99% of the entire body of Christ. Well, that's a conspiracy. It's a hidden agenda that's bad. That's basically what a conspiracy theory is, right? Absolutely. Well, if you believe that, like we do, we don't believe it. We know it. Uh, then if you keep that silent, then you become a co-conspirator with the conspiracy. Purpose. Yes, absolutely. You, you join with the enemy of God. What does that make you? That's... Well, I'm actually an enemy of God, so that's no good. So, of course, I think you're going to have to have a bucket of wisdom. If you're a pastor, let's say, and you've got 500 people in your congregation, I mean, you're not just going to go up there and blurt it out on Sunday morning. I think Ernie had the best uh, track of wisdom on that was to get your 10, you know, anchor families in a room, the, the men, and or maybe the 
both couple with couples and share with them what you know to be true and get a buy-in and then you know, or you go to the deacon board or whatever your structure is, and then you get the anchor families, and then, and then you go for it because it's it's so ill-advised to to think that a minister should keep this quiet because they're afraid people are going to backslide. That is not your responsibility. You need no. to let God handle people's reaction to the truth. Your job is to tell the truth without fear or favor of man. Absolutely. You can't hide this from people. This is. I think Ernie people, would be a good consultant for like if churches ever decided, you know what, we're just going to let everybody in on what's going on. They could call Ernie from Harbinger of the Harvest in and say, hey, we got this consultant. He's going to show you how to roll this thing out. That guy would be perfect. Absolutely. He would be the guy that would be hired for that, I think. Yes. Ernie's my bud. We talk often and it's it's a very difficult topic but i've had a number of people that i cornered on it and they finally blurted out john do you realize what you're saying <laughs> if this is true and and i'm thinking what are you saying like are you saying that because it's true that it's such a hard thing that you're going to ignore it like the fact that it's horrible but his piece of news doesn't isn't evidence that it's not happening that's right. my point Right. Well, I throw out there also, we're, we're still on the topic. We didn't go off topic. I mean, we're still talking about all truth is important. I mean, that's my whole point. But I mean, let's throw out there our personal beliefs because we get attacked for what we believe. I don't believe if you don't see this stuff that you're not saved. I don't believe that. I don't think you have to see it to be saved. There's only one truth, and that is Jesus Christ. That's my point of view. Uh, what do you think? Well, 100%. Because... It's the same blindness that keeps you from not seeing the Bible changes is the same one that keeps you from seeing that the moon landing is fake or that the earth is a brown ball. It's a variety of things, but it's the same thing. So are you saying that people that think they live on a spinning ball are going to hell? It's outrageous. No. 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 Absolutely not. It is perilous uh, because it seems clear that if if – if God is allowing Satan to, min to you know, uh, mess with the scripture's um, meanings in a bad way, two men in a bed, Jesus is saying, bring the people that reject me and slay them before me. Men are breastfeeding. You have all kinds of biblical paradoxes where you've got two men in a bed, two women grinding, which is a euphemism for sex in Job. Uh, you've got... Um, offering female sheep now you got offering reptiles to god these are biblical paradoxes yeah, it's not good all right and so what do you do with that is if that keeps going the characteristics and the doctrines of of the antichrist will be clearly delineated in your bible as we as it continues to get more and more unlike god right and so when he comes on the world scene he's going to be able to pick up the Bible and show the body of Christ that he is God. And they're going to go, oh, well, I guess I just sort of missed who Jesus was. I guess he really is Jesus. He just stole the thunder on my next point, but that's good because that's exactly what I was going to say, that this, this is a, it's not a salvational issue per se yet. Right. Yet. Because... The great falling away will happen. We know that because we did read the book. We just know the story. So we know that happens. And then the Antichrist will be revealed. Now, by the time I'm assuming, I don't know 100%, but I believe by the time he is revealed, they're done with their changes. They don't need to change anything else. You already got Jesus killing people in Luke. I mean, you got believers in Christ reading it like that's always been there, you know, so Jesus is, let's, let's talk about who Jesus is real quick. He is an all loving God, son of God, right? He commands you to forgive, love your neighbor as yourself, love your enemy. If someone takes something from you, don't go to, to get it back. Let them have it. Give them your cloak also. Beware of wolves of sheep in sheep's clothing. On and on and on. Nowhere in there do you not have the freedom to not believe in him. 
he does not kill you for not believing in him. That is not who he is. He doesn't come back and kill non-believers. He does not do that. That's not what he is. That's not who he is. That's not how this goes down. Now, those people that don't believe are condemned to hell, but that's by default. That's the system. That's how it's set up. The people that see the uh, the head chopping are not non-believers. That's us, guys. When we're here, that's us. So you need to read the story and understand how this thing actually ends and understand who Jesus is. He's all loving. He's an all loving God. That's who he is. That's my, mm. that's my two cents on that. Yeah. Well, I mean, they have an answer for everything because Jesus, when he said that, it's just talking about the judgment. You know, we all know God's going to judge the wicked. So they just suggest that that statement in the in the gospel is not referring to him in this world, but in the afterlife. But you have to twist the scripture to make that right. What what, what was your observation on that? You had a well, good observation. Well, I, I see. I am very versed personally in the gospels. Believe it or not, since I'm accused of not preaching the gospel. When I was in Afghanistan, I thought, you know what? I might not make it out of here, and I need to read the Bible. The Bible's a huge book. So I thought, what can I read that flows good and I can get it the most in my brain for the day I take off and I don't come back? That's literally my thought. So I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Matthew. Right. I did that for 11 months. Every wow. time I lay down, I read it till I fell asleep. I remembered where I was. I went back and I started from that point and I went through. Now, what I noticed in that observation, Luke has a cadence. It has a it has a story, an explanation, a story, an explanation. Left, right, just like marching. It says, hey, here's this story. Here's what it means. Here's this story. Here's what it means. And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere one day, kill everybody and have you know have the non-believers before me and I will slay them. No explanation. Right. There's no there's no it's just it's just like someone took it and put it in. And it's just like how can that even happen if you're reading it? How would you not spot that? Well, well, I was actually reading it. The proof of that is I'm seeing articles from LBGT apologists, and they're using two men in a bed to, and then one is taken to make the point that you can have a homosexual relationship and still be raptured. And I'm also watching the Muslims using the Jesus says, bring them here and slay me to make the point that Jesus is in jihad mode. Right. So it's, it's, I'm just, and I never heard those arguments in 35 years of being born again, Christian and in the ministry. So and it's all of a sudden, now. right. Where did it come from? It's all of a sudden. No, I, I would have known all that. I would have heard the same things for the last 40 years, not just in the last five years. Here's a couple of passages that you might take out of context to think that you should only focus on the gospel because Jesus never taught that. Uh, first one is 1 Corinthians 15, 3, where Paul says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. It's such a bizarre translation. Many people read of first importance and seem to conclude of only importance. First uh, Corinthians 2, 2, for I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so I wrote here, some people think when Paul said, I decided to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified, he means we should only preach the gospel uh, and nothing else, but really, if you look at it, what Paul was doing was he was contrasting his preaching of the gospel against the philosophers, just their lofty speeches, you know. And we all know that the Bible and the words of God that are in the Bible are, I don't know, how do you describe it? I mean, they're as high above any writings in this realm Absolutely. As high as the Alps are above a molehill in the meadow, you know, it's like you can't you can't even compare scripture to any other book. It's not literature. It the Bible contains the very words and thoughts of God Almighty. 
that's what believers agree. believe. I agree. Um, okay, so like you were saying, ministers care about people. So they're going to warn them if there's a tornado. It's not off limits to talk about things that are dangerous. And uh, a gospel-centered evangelism that becomes a gospel-only evangelism ceases to be properly evangelical. Acts 20, 25 would be the main scripture that people would rely on to make this claim, but it actually makes our point that the minister of the gospel can have a command of many spheres and he will be used in them. So Acts 20, 25 says, and indeed, now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will face, face me no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. So the whole counsel of God means you're, you're always taking everything into context before, from the entire Bible, Genesis to Revelation, to try to come to your conclusion. What is your, uh, how you're properly exegeting the scripture, what what is your interpretation is how we term it right right you have to consider genesis to revelation every time you're trying to make a decision um and so what that means is you're not only preaching the gospel because you have to consider all of the stories from the old you Testament. have to look at it as the gospel is the cake and everything that makes the cake is this other stuff so how can you understand how we get to one thing? How do you make a cake without eggs, without right. baking soda, without flour? You're like, yeah, let's have a cake, but no flour, no flour, guys, which is dude, yeah. nasty. That would be <laughs> so you you just like because guess what? There's two there's two things coming. We have an antichrist who's going to claim to be God and he's going to look like he's God, guys. He, we're going to look if we're around and we're saying he's not God, we're going to look as crazy as we do now. Yep about the bible as we do about him mark my words on this he's going to make himself look like he's the dude Ooh, but that's for the sure. one that does come is the real one and yep. if you don't know what makes up the real one hence the cake analogy you're not going to know who to worship you'll know the gospel you'll be like hey look this guy makes the guy he just this dude he knows all languages and he just healed a baby on on worldwide news he's not a bad guy mm. and he claims he's god maybe we got it wrong and right? what he's saying about himself is all in the scripture i must have just yeah you no know, i guess i didn't really know what i knew or whatever you're gonna careful. think yeah but well guess what john do you have anything you have to put out? Because I don't do three hours and yep, we're I flowing do. into the end of this thing. I do. So, I have. Is this final thoughts? Not yet. This is promotion of what you got going on. And then what, final thoughts is just for God. Oh, so okay. what do you have happening? What do you got going on in the future? Uh, we have um, uh, Monday night at 8 p.m. on freeconferencecall.com. The password is wake up or else. I'm training on how to move over to live in the private so you can kick all of the statutes, codes, and rules to the curb as an American state national. And you can have a whole variety of other benefits that I won't discuss openly on YouTube, but it's outrageous, and you should check that out. And um, also, uh, we've got some live streams coming up, so go over to Wake Up or Else and subscribe and uh, sign up for the newsletter. I'm going to get Mike back on there. We're going to do a, uh, a flat earth challenge. We will do that. And we're going to talk about gyroscopes because that's a killer topic. If you quit canceling on me, I will show up. You canceled me, didn't you? <laughs> it was, I did the thing without No, me. I canceled the first one and then the two other. Blah, 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 two. blah, blah, blah. <laughs> white noise, isn't it? It's all white noise. Oh, man. oh my I gotta, goodness. I, got, I lost my banner of final thoughts. I'm going to have to make one. I got a final thought. Okay, hold on, hold on, because you All have, right. have, it doesn't work unless you see that. All right, you have the audience. Awesome. Okay, so we were talking the other day, and we were talking about how Jesus told us, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. And then he describes what it will be like. Now, a lot of times 
when I've talked about that passage with people, we always talk about how in the days of Noah, they were doing genetic engineering. They were fiddling with the gene code and they're doing that now. And that's true, but that is not what Jesus emphasized. What he said was, as it was in the days of Noah, so will it be in the days of the Son of Man. They will be eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage right up until the time the flood came. And so all of us are stunned at how the unconvinced are just purposely willful ignorant and oblivious, and they're just doing their happy life. They don't know, they don't want to know, and they definitely don't want you to know. And that describes exactly what Jesus said. They will be eating and drinking because you think, oh, now they're, I'll show them this and then they'll really know. No, they're going to go right up into the end, a lot of them, until they're ushered into the COVID camp and they're now being told either deny Christ or we're going to cut your head off. Then they'll wake up. But until that happens, we're on our own. So we have communities like this, thank God, for Mike myself and others who are trying to create some sort of gatherings for us because I know what it's like. It's really a lonely road. So I love you guys, and uh, I do appreciate um, the opportunity to be involved in this for God's cause. It's really awesome. So thanks, Mike, for having me. Appreciate it, bud. Yeah, thank you for changing your mind because I know you're, you're really busy because I think we – we vacillated back and forth on actually doing this four yes. or five times. And finally, you're like, let's do it. And I'm like, let's well, I'll get, get you on while I can. Yes, sir. So thank you, my brother. And yeah. I will uh, give my final thoughts and close us out. You awesome. don't have to hang around. I am going to play uh, Oceans by these this father and son couple. It's pretty awesome. I mean, if you, cool, cool. If you listen to the song and you don't feel God, you need to really look inside <laughs> yourself on this one. Seriously. But thank you, John.